Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager in Dennis Prager's house. Dennis Prager's fireplace. Dennis Prager's bulldog. And the only reason I'm mentioning my name so often is to reassure you this really is my house. It's amazing. People ask me such interesting questions because I think people are used to being fooled a lot. And I don't fool people at all. So they go, I, I, they so often go, is that really, is that really, is that really? Or people will ask to people, people who work with me will often say, they will, they're always asked, so is he really, what is he really like? And the, the general answer, which I'm very touched by, is exactly what you see. That's him. That, that is. I like real. And so this is really my house. Somebody just said to me it last week, so I really like your set. Set? Who would make such a sloppy set? <laughs> Believe me, this would look a lot better if it were a set. I love that, a set. How could we make a place where the books are upside down or whatever is going on? No, no, books aren't upside down. That would be a bad sign. It means I didn't read them. Uh, but anyway, it is really my house. It is really, this is the place I do my writing and my cigar smoking and my pipe smoking. And my wife sits with me the whole time that I'm smoking. And you know what I'm going to talk about one time about the, the issue of wanting to be with your spouse it's a very interesting and very sensitive subject because i i i personally like to be with her all the time but a lot of spouses and i'm not it's not a judgment it's just a fact there are a lot of men and a lot of women who like their space and i've done a, ma a male female hour on that i i have a, a radio show for those of you who don't know every day three hours it's easily found on the internet, Dennis Prager, or on a local station if you're in the United States. And I've done, for about 15 years, a male-female hour every Wednesday. And I've done this subject. It's very interesting about people who want their space. But listen, people have different natures. I, I'm not a spaceman. <laughs> I, I don't want my space. <laughs> um, I, 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 my view is I married her to be with her not to have my own space but i respect those who want it listen my view is if it works for your marriage you have my love and affection and keep it up so uh, i i acknowledge that but i'm happy that she sits with me uh, all night and that she endures she doesn't even endure it she doesn't mind the cigar smoke cigarette smoke that would be a no-no that would be cause for uh, space <laughs> Big space. And I don't blame her. I don't like cigarette smoke either. Anyway, welcome. This was just a long hello from my study in my home. And uh, I appreciate all your kind comments about Otto. Uh, I often note that he is I, perhaps the best known dog in America at this time. And he's even known internationally. And I am proud to tell you, I mention this often because I admit I have some pride. Uh, it shows I raised him well. It has not gone to his head whatsoever. All the fame means nothing to Otto. Nothing. That's right. You'd think he'd go to other dogs and, you know, <laughs> who are you? But he doesn't. Okay. Uh, happy 4th to you Americans. This is seen all over the world, so if you're not American, you'll still find this of interest. This is a very important subject because America is... Uh, whether you like it or not, and I hope you like it, but I know many don't, the most important country in the world, I would say since, uh, since World War I. And that's 100 years ago. So it, it, it's, it, it's a significant subject, America. I want to talk to you about my own feelings about this country. And I, I actually didn't realize, it was a very interesting development in my life, I didn't realize how much... I, I'll use the word, I, I love this country. It doesn't mean I love every American. Uh, I'm, I'm not a fool. The, the, every country has good and bad people, okay? It's a fact. The worst countries have had good people. The best countries have had bad people. That We, we recognize that. But all things considered, I, I, like, I, I like the American people. I think that there are a lot of problems. Uh, in that Americans used to appreciate what they had much more than they do today. 
So July 4th is the American Independence Day. Whether you're watching this in July on the day that uh, of even July 4th actually, uh, or in the middle of December sometime, it doesn't matter. These, all of these fireside chats are relevant, hopefully, for the foreseeable future. The ideas that I talk about are not time-bound. But anyway, a happy 4th to you if you're American, and if you're not, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, my love of this country. I actually realized it when I, I, I didn't realize it growing up, to be honest. I took it for granted. It's a free country, and I, I also realized how rare it was as a Jew in a Jewish family. I realized it's so rare in Jewish history, and I taught Jewish history on the college level at Brooklyn College. I realized I, I, how rare it was for Jews to feel so secure and, and non-self-conscious. I wrote a piece, which you should take a look at. It's on the Internet. It's what, I write a column every week. And I wrote a piece on joining the Simi Valley Rotary Club. Did I ever talk about that, that you recall? No good. So uh, the Rotary Club is an international organization. And I, I, in my 20s, I moved from New York to California, and I've been in California ever since. And I joined a, uh, 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 the Simi Valley Rotary Club. Simi Valley is located about 30 miles uh, northwest, I think that's about right, of, uh, of uh, Los Angeles. And at the time, it was, it was deserted. There were two restaurants in the entire city. Today, it is a booming city. But it, it was then, it was empty. But I, I lived there for three years because I was brought to, to head an educational institute in Simi Valley, a gigantic Jewish retreat center. And uh, so I lived there for three years, and I joined the Rotary Club. I was the only Jew in the club. And what I wrote in my article was what dawned upon me was this is the beauty. This is the beauty and this is quintessential America. It didn't matter. That's the key. It meant essentially nothing to the other guys. I say guys because at that time Rotary was all male. They knew I was a Jew. I was the head of the Jewish Institute located in that city. But it didn't matter. I had a zero self-consciousness. Uh, I didn't, they didn't walk on eggshells. I didn't walk on eggshells. I was Dennis. Not Dennis the Jew. Dennis. And had I been black, it wouldn't have been Dennis the Black. And had I been Latino, it wouldn't have been Dennis the Latino. And had I been Armenian, because there are a lot of Armenians here in Southern California, it wouldn't have been Dennis the Armenian. Whereas almost every place else in the world, even nice countries, it would have been Dennis the. And then you fill in the, the, the ethnic or national or religious identity. That's the thing about America. It doesn't matter now did it did it always not matter no obviously because uh look we had so much racism in american history that is true it mattered if you were black in much of american history tragically but not not already by the time i had moved uh, in the 1970s by that time uh, 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 race meant nothing to the vast majority of of uh, of non of majority Americans, majority meaning uh, it white. It meant, it meant nothing. Unfortunately, what we have today is a, a movement backwards by people called progressives or the left who think you should honor race. What a, what a, what a, that's a racist idea. I don't honor race. Why would I honor race? I honor people. I don't honor race. The idea of honoring race is racist. It's the, it's the essence of racism. Uh, it, it's just so remarkable. And this, so it's one of the reasons that I loved America because it handled all the various ethnic and national identities and religious identities of America so beautifully. You were, you were another Rotarian. You were another member of the Lions Club or the Kiwanis Club or, or the Book Club or the church or, or wherever it would be. See, that's, that's what was so remarkable, and is remarkable. 
The gr one of the greatest lies in history is that America is racist. It's a lie. It's just a lie. This is a great place. He, by the way, here's an interesting proof of how non-racist America really is. Uh, there was an article recently, and I, I will talk about it on the air, and I may write about it, but uh, we should put it up even at PragerU, but it'll be at DennisPrager.com. And it, it, it is just a, a handful of the incredibly large number of racist hoaxes that have been uh, created in this country, that have been uh, uh, initiated by, uh, by blacks who, especially students, black students on campuses, where they're told, you're hated, you're hated, you're hated, every white is a racist, every, every white is a racist. And so uh, a swastika on a black kid's uh, dormitory uh, door uh, or a noose uh, uh, representing hanging blacks from the terrible era when, when, when blacks were, in fact, lynched. And uh, the vast majority of them were not true. They, they were actually perpetrated by a black trying to show how racist things were. The most famous being Je Je Jesse, is it Jesse? Jesse Smollett. Smollett, yeah, Jesse Smollett, yeah. Uh, who who uh, created this whole, I was attacked by two racists shouting uh, racist epithets at me. And he made up the whole thing. He was the way he hired two guys to do it. We got the video of the two guys buying the rope. <laughs> that he ended up showing to the policeman. Oh, you see, look, they put this rope. Yeah, but you bought the rope. So that's a little suspect. <laughs> it's, that's called a hoax. There were so many of these hoaxes. So here is my point. If the country were really racist, who would need a hoax? Did Jews in Germany in the 1930s ever make up that they were attacked by an anti-Semite? No. There were no hoaxes because there was the real deal. There really was a lot of anti-Semitism. There wasn't one hoax. No Jew made up, oh, look at that, I was attacked by people calling me bad names as a Jew. Unfortunately, Jews didn't need hoaxes. There was the real deal. The very existence of all these hoaxes proves the point about how little racism there is. America is just smeared constantly. People have to make up stuff to, 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 to tell how bad it is. I was just—I just saw an article today in in some uh, music website that Western classical music is for whites. Is that ridiculous? Beethoven is for whites. Mozart is for whites. You know the most—you know the the place where classical music proportionately is probably the most listened to. Japan. They're not white. They just love great music. There's no such thing as white music. The, the idea is preposterous. Shakespeare isn't great for whites. Mozart isn't great for whites. They're great for people. Unless you think that people are intrinsically different because of their skin pigment. It, it, it's just, it drives me crazy. It, these are bad, bad stuff. I have a theory. I got to talk about boredom on another one because I think a lot of people are bored and they need causes. There's a very big factor on the left in America. They need causes because they 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 don't have religion. They don't have a a, a patriot. They don't have a strong patriotic sense about the country. So nothing gives them meaning. So they have to create meanings. And uh, they they do. Like like the the worst example is this Antifa crowd which beat up, they just beat people up, wearing masks. They're, they are, I, I said on the radio, they're the closest to the Hitler Youth that I, I have seen in, in, in my life in America. It's a very scary crowd. They're empty. This gives them, beating people up in the name of anti-racism gives them meaning. I wonder how many of them are married and have children. I'll bet you the proportion is tiny. Because marriage and children gives people stability and meaning. It was uh, George Gilder who wrote a brilliant book that I read in college. One of the great thinkers. He's done a PragerU course, by the way. At least, I think, two courses. And uh, when I was in college, I read his book, Naked Nomads. It's about single men. 
he made a proud, profound point. He said, uh, you ever notice uh, who commit most violent crimes? Forget color, forget nationality, forget ethnicity. Single men. Made a big impact on me. Men, men, as a rule, get better when they marry. By the way, so do women. Both equally, but with men it's more dramatic because they're much less likely to commit crimes if they marry, and then if they have children, certainly. So that's why I say, I wonder how many of these Antifa go home to a wife and children. Or, or a husband and children. There, there are women in, in it too. Anyway, it's a very bad thing. When, when bad is called good, that's terrible. And when good is called bad, that is terrible. There's a biblical verse on that from Isaiah. Woe unto those, or Hosea. I don't remember if it was Isaiah or Hosea. My Isaiahs get mixed up. And it is, woe unto those who call good evil and evil good. When you break the moral compass, your society is doomed. Hold on, let's hear Otto for a moment. Uh, he got self-conscious. The guy was snoring till I said, let's hear Otto for a moment, and then he shuts up. Okay, that's my man. I'll tell you, I find that so calming. It's a danger. I'll start snoring. He does that at night. He sleeps in our room. And it's very, it's actually very, very relaxing. Dogs add, add apparently they say dogs add uh, years to your life. Dogs, friends, religion. I'm doing well. <laughs> Got all that. It's nice. Anyway... To call this country evil, racist, sexist, misogynist, all these terms, when I speak at colleges, which I do a lot, and kids line up, and I always say, if you disagree with me, you're first. You get the chance to ask me a question first. And some young woman will get up and, and say, uh, you know, how oppressed she is because she's a female. And I go, I don't believe you're oppressed. I'm sorry. You know, one of the, probably among the luckiest females to ever exist in history to be an American female. And at a college? Pampered at a college? And you're oppressed? I, I guess it's just staggering naivete and ignorance about what the world is like to call America bad. It's, 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 it bothers me. Because civilization is fragile. You can lose it in a generation. Nobody knows this better than Jews. Germany was the most advanced culture in the world. Musically, artistically, literarily, scientifically. And then in, in, in a generation, it became the most barbaric country on earth. Things can flip very quickly. Because the human being is not necessarily good. Human nature is not uh, good. Not only bad, but not good. So things can happen. And I worry about it. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to mess around with this fundamentally good place that I live in called America. One final word. America was founded on the idea of liberty. Let, let people be free. Let the government get out of people's lives. No more king, and no more government. Of course we have government, we're not for anarchy. But, but let the government be limited, limited government. The only country in the world founded on the concept of limited government. That is huge. That is huge. Those of us called conservative have, have a motto, if you will. Please leave us alone. That's it. That's what I ask. Just please. I love my family, I love my friends, I, I, I love my religion, I love my God, I love my work. I have so many loves in my life, leave me alone. Obviously I need you to protect my country, we need, we need a military, we need police, we need firemen. I understand all that, and the, and the people who are not helped by private means and by charities, they need the government as a, as a, as a you know, 
a secure place to find, you know, a, a what is it, the net, safety net, yeah. A safety net, I agree, we all agree to that, every conservative does. But it's the last resort, not first resort. Limited government, and, and again, please to leaving us alone. We've, we've created something beautiful here. That's why the world, so much of the world wants to move here. There's no place of opportunity like America. It's, it's just remarkable. I, I was with a, a woman from Sri Lanka. She was my Uber driver recently. And I, I wish I could put her on the radio. She's so grateful. She said this... I came to America, this notion that America is racist. I'm brown, she said. I never experienced a racist minute in my life here. From the day I arrived. So what, what, what is she, uh, is she an aberration? It's like my grandfather came from uh, Austria. My grandfather was, which was, that's where Hitler came from. He, he saw a lot of anti-Semitism in Austria. So he thought every non-Jew essentially was an anti-Semite. Because he, he brought European sensibilities to America. So he would drive a car. I would be there, the little kid, his grandson. And he'd be cut off by a driver. And you know what he would say? Anti-Semite. <laughs> and I remember thinking at, at about eight years of age, uh, Papa, just curious, how do, you, how do you know he was an anti-Semite? How, how do you know he even knew you were a Jew? <laughs> Maybe he cut you off because he's a lousy driver. So uh, it, 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 people see what they want to see. You want to see racism, you'll see racism. But, it, but you've, you've made it up like my grandfather did about the drivers. You made it up. Does it exist at all? Of course it exists at all. Everything bad exists. <laughs> it, but it's like saying if, if somebody has a bad cold and you say, how are you? So they could say, oh, I'm fine, but I got a cold. Or, oh, my God, I am just a sickly person. There's a big difference. Yes, America has a cold, but it, it's just a cold. It's not, it's, it, we're not morally sick. That's, that's, that's what I, uh, that's what I, I appreciate this place immensely. And I hope that uh, the left doesn't, uh, doesn't tear down these, this, this great idea of, of, of free people. Because people don't yearn to be free. They yearn to be taken care of. That's, that's what I told the European Parliament a couple of weeks ago in Brussels. They asked me to speak on freedom, and that was, that was the key point I made. People yearn to be taken care of. They don't yearn to be free. F with freedom comes responsibility. Take, being taken care of, you don't have to do anything. Happy 4th. All righty. How, how are we doing on time? Did I take a lot? 23. Whoa, I did take a lot. All right, here we go. Bryce, 19. And let's see. We welcome your questions. What do people do? Send it to PragerU.com. What, what do they do to send me questions? Fireside chat. Fireside chat? I'm sorry? PragerU.com at the fireside chat. PragerU.com at the fireside chat page. Okie dokie. Bryce is 19 years old in Hudsonville, Michigan, USA, USA. Hi, Dennis. Hi. I have noticed that my small Christian university is beginning to push cliche left-wing propaganda. As someone who enjoys politics and debate, I would like to fight back, but I feel I can't be, quote, too controversial because my dad used to attend and work there. So many current staff members are close family friends. How can I make change without hurting relationships. Oh boy, that look, this question applies to so many people. If the left didn't label everybody they differ with as six herb, sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, homophobic, racist, and bigoted, then it would be a non-issue. You just civilly debate or discuss or dialogue or even argue and then go to lunch together. But they don't do that because, for the most part, they dismiss us as evil, which is disgusting. <laughs> I've devoted my life to goodness. It's a, it's a, a smearing is not arguing. 
there should be no issue with you taking taking issue with what's happening. You obviously you do it civilly, and they should respond civilly. But I am more and more of the opinion that you can't let people bully you. And that's what happens a lot. People are just so afraid to express themselves. People come to me in airports in the United States, and they'll whisper that they're conservative. That's ridiculous. Or, you know, a lot of my peop- my friends at- or my colleagues at work don't know it, Dennis, but you know, I'm conservative. Or I'm a Republican, even. That's what they do. But they, you, you can't get afraid. That's a very important thing. When I, uh, I spoke in San Francisco about a half a year ago, and s- six members of the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra came to have dinner with me. And since I'm into classical music and conduct periodically, I was, I was really honored, because it's a great orchestra, and I really wanted to meet these people. And... and, and San Francisco is a very left-wing city, but the, the members of the orchestra know these people are conservative. They get along fine. Because they're not intimidated. That's all. You can't be intimidated. I know it's easy for me to say to you, but hey, I get attacked a lot. I, I, I live, I walk the walk in this case. And I sleep better. And anyway, I have to answer to God and my conscience, and my wife. I'm not sure which order. (laughs) Okay. Sarah, 38, St. George, Utah. My sister is transitioning now into a man. So if she's 38, I guess her sister's in her 30s or 40s. My husband and I have decided that my three youngest children are too young to have this discussion with, but I do think that I need to explain it to my 11 and a half year old son. My question is, how do I do? How do I explain to him that his auntie Ella is now Uncle Ezra, in an age of appropriate manner? Look, it isn't easy, <laughs> but I'm a I'm a big believer in truth. There are people who are troubled. Trouble is not an insult. Trouble is not an attack. Trouble is not a moral judgment. I mean, please, if you are 35 and you now believe or you believe the whole time but you now are finally acknowledging it whatever the issue is you are not your sex i mean let's let's be honest there are only two sexes okay whatever nonsense you will hear at the university there are only two sexes it, it is binary okay of course it is it's chromosomally bri- binary in a tiny fraction of humanity, there are people with both the genitalia. Okay, that's, we'll leave that aside. And uh, this is a troubled person. It's called gender dysphoria, where you do not identify with your gender. I don't know why that is the case uh, with your sister, obviously. I'm not sure your sister knows. I accept it as true. This is what your sister feels. But here's the irony. Even your sister doesn't deny there are two genders. Your sister simply says, I am a male. I am of the male gender. So the, the joke about this whole thing is, if there really aren't two genders, what, what is there to transition to? The very fact that, that she's transitioning to a man means she's acknowledged there's one other gender. She's not transitioning to nothing. She's not transitioning to a third gender. Of course, there were only two genders. That's what that the whole trans movement is based on that no- notion. So you could say to your 11 and a half, look, uh, you know, um, Aunt, uh, Auntie Ella uh, is, 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 is troubled in this way. We love, we love Auntie Ella, who, who will now uh, act uh, to us and, and we will be kind and respond to Uncle Ezra. That, what are you going to say? That's the decent thing to do. But uh, it, none of this denies that there are two genders. 
Auntie Ella may in fact be happy as Uncle Ezra and may not be. The, the doctor at Johns Hopkins University who pioneered transition surgery gave it up. And he's written about it. You could read it. He wrote years ago why he stopped doing it. He said, because the suicide rate after, after transitioning was even greater than, than before. The, the, the issues that people, most people have, some people transition and, and, and it works. And I, I, I respect that. But, uh, for a lot of people, the issues are not gender related. They may manifest themselves in gender dysphoria, but there are many other issues that are deeper than that. And if they're not resolved, the transition won't help. And there are people who regret they transitioned. You could read about it. USA Today had an article by a member of its uh, editorial board, actually, who wrote, I transitioned to a woman, and I realized after, I don't remember how many years, it was a big mistake. I, I brought with me all the problems that I had prior to the transitioning, and I lost all those years to develop as what I really am, a man. It's, uh, it's worth reading. We need compassion, and we need standards. Both are important. And I feel bad for your kids because it, it is it is disorienting. It, it is true. It's, it, and people who transition need to understand, you know, the world, you, you want the world to say, ah, oh, no problem. Now you're a man. That's, that's, that's a little narcissistic. It's it's not easy for the rest of us who love you, who have known you as as a woman your whole life, to go. Oh, now you're a man. She doesn't exist anymore. It's you're asking a lot. I think we should try to accommodate you, but you have to understand you're asking a lot. How we doing? Thirty-two. Okay. Next one was from Norway. We'll try to do it next time. These are important subjects. They need to be seriously addressed. Calling people names is not seriously addressing them. That's one of the things we try to do at PragerU. We don't call anybody names. We try to address this stuff seriously. So on behalf of Otto and everybody in my home, I look forward to being with you next week. Don't forget a couple of things. That we come out with a video every week at PragerU. There's a very touching one now with Neil Ferguson, the professor, major, major world historian. Uh, and it's perfectly appropriate to this subject. On his experience on becoming an American. It's very touching. Hope you'll watch it. Hope you will get my... Uh, my book, The Rational Bible, that's the source of my insights into life. It's meant to change your life. The first two volumes came out. It's called The Rational Bible. So until next week, thank you so much for being with me. I'm Dennis Prager, and see you then. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.